Hey everyone, so when it comes to the Holocaust, a lot of people think to themselves, well, if I was living in those times, things would be different, I would protest, I would help people, whatever the case may be. And people look in different directions when trying to think about how their own society devolves into chaos. Check out this discussion, this very interesting discussion between Douglas Murray and Jordan Peterson about the origins of the Holocaust and some of the the backdrop that was not only going on, but it, that was going ideologically on in people's minds. In our age, you hear people all the time saying things like the lessons of the Holocaust. Yeah. Say, what are you talking about? Which lessons? And generally, right. it, generally it devolves into kind of banality of like, be nice to people. Like, don't, yeah. don't mass murder people. Sure. Okay. Right. Uh, beyond that. Right. Uh, and the devil's in the details, the unfortunately. The devil's in the details on this. Mm. In fact, by the way, uh, uh, it's very hard to say anything new about Auschwitz. And um, you sort of feel everything is being said that could be said in a way, and at the same time, we know nothing about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I was very struck, Martin Amos, who died recently, wrote a novel in the 90s that was very, very controversial at the time, called Time's Arrow. Uh, everything goes backwards. The whole plot of the novel goes, time is reversed. Uh, so um, if somebody is sick, they go to a pile of sick and inhale it and then walk happily around their day. So it's, a, it's a, anyhow, it's a device that, that works well at times as an abusive uh, parent. The child is crying, the, the parent smacks the child and he stops crying. Mm. Yes, it's, 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 mm. a, it's a device that makes you able to look at things in an interesting way. He, but he was much criticized for Damis in the 90s because he does the Holocaust, he addresses the Holocaust in the book. And everyone said, oh, you're using it as a literary device. I actually think by doing what he did, he actually showed one of the very few new insights I've ever seen about the Holocaust, mm -hmm. which is that the people whose job it is to take the bodies out of the ovens would give birth to these people from the ovens late in the novel one of them confides to one of his colleagues that he's getting nervous because the people that they're bringing out of the ovens now don't seem right. They're more and more disabled. They're more and more ill. Is it worth even taking them out of the ovens? So strangely enough, by doing it in reverse, you get an idea of how it started. Mm -hmm. Right. You get an idea of how it started. Yeah, well, the thing is, Which is terrible a, things start, have, start one thing at a time. Right? And in this case, again, by a desire on behalf of some people to alleviate suffering mm -hmm. or to um, or to claim, some, to, the, to, to, claim, claim yes, to claim to alleviate, alleviate suffering, suffering mm -hmm. to, to, to view some lives as less valued than others. Mm -hmm perhaps hardly worth living, goes back to what we were saying about Canada today. Mm -hmm. To view, I urge people to think of it this way around, because if you think about it this way around, it's much easier to see how you, how you start. Mm -hmm. But, um, but the other well, thing- Well, that is how things started in, in Nazi Germany yeah. too, right? Is that because the progression towards the death camps was a progression through euthanasia. And I've looked at a fair number of the propaganda films from the mid thirties, where the the Nazis were starting to clean up the asylums, you yes, know, and they would right. go in and like I'd been in backward asylums when when I worked yep. at uh, the Douglas Hospital in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. There were still people there who had been on the wards who hadn't been deinstitutionalized, who had been on the wards for like four decades, and they would kind of lurk in the corridors that were underground at the Douglas Hospital because it was like a university campus that was connected by underground. Uh, um, passageways. And it was like Dante's Inferno down there. I mean, yeah, sure. and you could easily, you could easily go there and make the case that, you know, oh my God, is, is a life of being on a backward in a psychiatric hospital, you know, wrapped up in a, yes. in a straitjacket for three decades yes. worth living. And well, that brings, that brings that whole terrible conundrum up in front of you. And, and, I, there's no, there's no like, there's no simple answer you can jump to there. But one of the answers, the answer that that is something that should therefore be handed to the state to deal with in oh, some efficient manner, that's definitely not a good. But the idea that it's a question that the individual should wrestle with is, is naturally the case. I mean, that, that, that 
that this is something that people should think about and will always think about as long as people think, it seems to me very obvious. I was, I, I've always been struck by um, uh, one of Elie Wiesel's works, uh, who was of course in Auschwitz. I don't know if you know, The Trial of God. Did you ever read that one? It's, no. It's, a, it's, it's worth reading and there's a version of it he replays in another of his books, I think, of the Gates of the Forest called. There's, anyhow, it was something that I think Wiesel saw in Auschwitz, but there was a night where um, in, the, in the camp, they have the, 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 some rabbis who decide that they will put God on trial. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And they, Vizel describes it in extraordinary detail and it's riveting, uh, the silence in the room. And um, uh, eventually uh, the case for the prosecution, the case for the uh, uh, defense are given by very, very learned rabbis uh, from Poland. And uh, nobody could know more than these men routinely knew, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which is a reminder of what was lost. But uh, in, the, in the end, they find God guilty. See, the Jews and, never did that in the Old Testament. Well, no, right? but then something very important oh, happens. Okay, okay. Which is that they find God guilty and there's a silence in the heart. And they realize what they've done. And then somebody says, one of the rabbis says, okay, it's Friday night. We need to go and do our prayers. And mm -hmm. they do. Mm -hmm. There are two interesting theological elements, I think, to this conversation that go into the the worst of the worst, how, how these particular things can get widespread and on a societal level turn into something uh, of the caliber of the Holocaust. The first thing to remember is that every human being is created in the image of God. And that means no matter what, from the beginning until the end of a person's life, it's up to no state, no individual has the right to determine what the quality of one's life is. Because as was mentioned in the conversation, there were various manifestations of euthanasia and so forth given to people that were deemed to be unfit for life, didn't have quality of life. Uh, and that is something that needs to be uh, sort of seen right from the beginning that there's never an excuse to end somebody's life prematurely. The human being is created in the image of God from the beginning of their lifetime to the end of their lifetime. And it's up to no individual or, or state force to, to say anything different and to minimize and to take away uh, any element of the person's life. That's number one. Number two is this idea that they bring up at the end, talking about the trial of God, which is based on a book by Elie Wiesel. And the, he mentions specifically that even after God is found guilty, they decide, okay, well, it's, it's time to get ready for Shabbat. It's time to get ready for the Sabbath. And this kind of puts, uh, th this is an interesting theological take because a lot of people want to dismiss the concept of God because of bad things that happen. And that, it's certainly an understandable thing that a person would say to themselves, well, how could I believe in God with all this bad stuff that goes on? But look at the approach that these rabbis took in Auschwitz. And they said to themselves, even though God is guilty and we can't find a way to defend him, again, this is all sort of a fictitious mock trial, but even though we can't find a way to uh, defend him, we still have to prepare for the Sabbath. And it's that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an important point to recognize that just because you don't like the way that God does things sometimes, or so the way that things play out in the world, doesn't affect whether God is true or not true, whether there is a God or not. You can't say I, my belief in God only depends on whether I like the way that he runs his world. God and, and the justice of God are two completely different uh, subjects that unfortunately are intertwined with each other. So two theological insights I think important to recognize in this conversation, an interesting snippet of a conversation, and would love to hear what you think about the matter. You can uh, inform us in the, in the comments below 